from the book, you were brutally honest about the affairs that you had while you were married. Mm -hmm. And my question to you is, why? Why did you do it? Hey folks, Pete here from Tyrish Times. And today we have an interview for you. I interviewed an author of a book called Leaving Thailand, a memoir by Steve Ross. And it's all about a guy who spent seven years in Thailand back in the 90s. And he describes his experiences in Thailand and also when he goes back to the United States with his wife, Thai wife. And he is absolutely brutally honest in this book about many things, especially his marriage. And we'll get into that in the interview. So, if you like this book and you're interested in buying it after you watch the interview, you can find the link in the description box for Amazon so you can buy the book there. And if you're not already subscribed, hit that subscription button, folks. We're not messing around here on Tyrish Times. We want to get to 5K. We need your help. Hit that subscription button. Give us a like. And I'm also interested to hear your opinion on this interview. So in the comment section below, give me your honest opinion. All right, let's get into it. All right, everybody, Steve, thanks very much for doing this. Thank you for having me. I'm flattered by the invitation. Yeah, so let me just say straight off, when I read your book, I was only expecting to skim the book and I was expecting to just pick some questions out of it. But then I got reading it and uh, it's very, it was, well, it's entertaining, funny, frustrating. Frustrating. Yeah. There was points where I was like, come on, what's going on, Steve? Yeah. What are you doing? Yeah, yeah. Um, very sad as well in some parts. Yes. Well, thank you. I'm glad that all comes across. And it's uh, there are parts in it. Uh, I go back and reread it from time to time, or parts of it. And there's been a lot, a lot of my, the last 20 years of my life where I've been saying exactly that, that same thing. Steve, what are you doing? Why did you make this obviously self-harming decision to leave Thailand? Uh, and, and as of yet, uh, countless hours spent at three in the morning staring at the ceiling over my bed. I have never come up with a suitable answer. The easy answer is, it was for the children. I wanted to raise my kids in uh, America. And uh, I had taught, when I first got here, I did the English teaching thing like everybody else, and I had taught in the public schools on Phuket. And the, I knew the public schools in Iowa were just uh, much better and free. And I was a little homesick. I'd been on Phuket seven straight years. And uh, I kind of wanted to go home. And uh, uh, I, I either quit my job or got fired. I'm not sure which happened, and now it's moot. But I left the, the great cushy job, probably the best job I ever had. And I said to my ex, uh, what do you think? Should we try? We have a house in Iowa City, Iowa, across the street from an elementary school. What do you say we try America? And she shocked the hell out of me by saying, yeah, OK, let's try it. And before she could change her mind, I had all four of us on a plane. And we went home and uh, had plenty of time to think about that decision ever since. And, uh, but here we are, you know, what's done is done. We make decisions and we live with the results of those decisions for the rest of our lives. Let's backtrack a little bit. Sure. You spent seven years in Thailand in the 90s. Right. Tell us, what were you doing? Well, I came on holiday. I was working in the film industry in New York City and uh, great years, loved New York City. It was the Reagan years and I had Reagan dollars in my pocket. $100,000 a year, putting every dime of it straight up my nose. And an art director who gave me a lot of work said, for MTV, she said, uh, you know, you're no fun on the set anymore. You're too tense, you're too keyed up, you're too coked up. Uh, I want you to leave for a few months, and when you come back, if you're fun again, I'll keep giving you work. So I planned a three-month trip that would begin in Bangkok, go through Phuket, uh, Indonesia, Java, Bali, and end with a cross-country trek across Australia from north to south and I got as far as Phuket and blew off all my deposits and all my reservations and just spent three months on Phuket and basically uh, then I spent seven of the next nine years on Phuket. I gave up my film career, I gave up a rent control department on Broadway in New York City, probably the, again another self-harming uh, self uh, decision. And uh, if I had kept that apartment, I wouldn't need to work today. I could live off renting out, subletting that apartment on Broadway. But no, I thought I was never going to come back to America. I was going to live the rest of my life on Phuket. 
So, uh, yeah, seven of the next nine years, between 1989 and 1997, I spent seven of those years on Phuket, started teaching English. Well, started just with the Reagan dollars in my pocket, spent a year just hanging on the beach shooting pool, and uh, then I needed money, started teaching English for the hotels, uh, taught in the Phuket Yacht Club, Le Meridien, uh, Kata Beach Resort, the Boathouse, and the Boathouse hired me to do PR, and I had been writing, I've always been a writer, I've always written uh, essays and uh, started writing at that time. It was a boom time for print media. And I started writing for Phuket Magazine, started writing for The Nation in Bangkok. And uh, there were uh, in-flight magazines all up and down the Pacific Rim. Eventually, I was selling stories and essays to uh, uh, in-flight magazines from Christchurch to uh, Honolulu, all the way up and down the Pacific Rim. And it was a boom time. I've never made in my life since then as much money as I was making in 1997 on Phuket. Uh, we went back to America and my income went Bzzz! which threw a lot of uh, tension into the marriage and uh, the marriage did not survive. Well, let's get into the questions then about your ex-wife. Right. Um, because in the book, she does come across as being quite a vindictive person. Was she really that bad? Well, if that's the way she comes across, I've done my job as a writer. Yeah, and, and obviously she, she should write her own book. People should read her book. And then between the two, you would get the full picture of what happened. Uh, she doesn't have anything nice to say about me. She said her shit in court. Uh, she damaged me uh, uh, considerably by saying untrue things about me uh, in the Johnson County family court during our divorce. Uh, and... Uh, you know, so I don't feel too much uh, guilt about writing in this book my feelings about her. Everything I say is true. Everything I say she did, she did. And uh, there it is. If you're going to write a memoir, if you're going to write about yourself, as I do, you have to write about yourself warts and all, and that includes bad decisions like who you marry. And so I am honest about her. There's a lot of stuff that's not in the book. <laughs> that would have been worse. You know, the, the, the thing about writing creative nonfiction is it's playing the music of what really happened. So you don't make anything up. You don't lie. You don't make up stories, but you're allowed to leave shit out in the interest of storytelling, in the interest of building a compelling narrative. And so there's a lot of shit left out of this book. Uh, and everything that's in it is the God's honest truth. Uh, you say in the book that you never loved her, but you proposed mm -hmm. anyway. Yeah. Seem, seemed like a really good idea. We were both public relations managers in competing hotels on Phuket. And in those days, when you threw an event as a public relations manager, you had a ribbon cutting, you had a guest chef coming in, you had four members of the Bangkok Symphony Orchestra coming down to play chamber music in your dining room, whatever it was, you wanted to fill the room. So you invited all the other public relations managers on the island, and you would come to support each other, and you would fill up the empty chairs in the room. And so we kept meeting each other over and over and over. And uh, my mother came to visit and uh, she took, the, my ex-wife took my mother under her wing, opened up her hotel to her. And uh, my mother fell in love with her first. And then I said, uh, after my mother left, I kind of said, uh, hey, you want to get married? And she said, yeah, how's Thursday for you? And I said, great. And we had this big lavish wedding and I spent every dime I had. And then I was, I was stuck in that. But I was at a point in my career, you know, I was 36 years old and unmarried. If you're a 36 year old farang unmarried in Thailand, you know, there is that stench of farang kikai about you. You don't go beyond a certain stage if you're working for locals. And I was working for the great grandson of a king. I was working for a mom luang at the boathouse, uh, mom luang tree uh, tewakun. And I knew that my career was hindered by the fact that I was a single guy at 36. So I wanted to get married for that reason. She wanted to get married for similar reasons. She was 29, a Thai woman at 29, still unmarried. Uh, her family was pressuring her to get married. Her boss was, and she didn't want to marry a Thai guy because he would make her give up her career and stay home and have babies. She wanted to marry a Farang, but not a Farang key guy. I had a respectable job. I spoke Thai. Uh, she was a college graduate. She spoke English. On paper, this match was great. It looked fantastic. And uh, 
you know, the problem is there was no love. And if you're going to marry somebody, you need love, you know, you, you, honest to God, to face the challenges of raising children, moving across the planet, starting a new life in another country. You need to be in love. You cannot weather all of that with a business relationship, which is what we had. But once we had children, we conce conceived a child the day we got married. And once we had children, we were both uh, there for the long haul. And, and uh, you know, we stuck it out till my youngest turned 18, and we have not spoken to each other since that day. I have had no contact with the woman since uh, my youngest child turned 18, and I think we're both happy with that. Where is she now? She's still in Iowa City, Iowa. She unfortunately has developed a, uh, a non-metastatic brain tumor in her frontal lobe, which has robbed her of the vision in one eye, gives her terrible migraines, she can't work. So this state of Iowa supports her. She gets her rent, she gets a gas allowance, she gets food, uh, she gets all her medical care paid, which she would get none of that coming back to Thailand. So she, she's going to stay, I think, the rest of her life in Iowa City, Iowa, and uh, you know, be a ward of the state, basically. And uh, you know, uh, I, who's signing off on her green card now? I have no idea, but it ain't me. From the book, you were brutally honest about the affairs that you had while you were married. Mm -hmm. And my question to you is, why? Why did you do it? Well, you know, after we conceived our second child, my ex-wife and I didn't make eye contact. We didn't hold hands. We didn't touch each other. We slept in a king-size bed with two infants between us. Uh, and this was Thailand. This is Thailand. And I was not going, I was a young man still. I was in not yet 40. And uh, so, yeah, I, I took advantage of the commercial sex industry that, that exists here. And she knew that I did. And until we went to divorce court in the United States, she never said a word about it. She was perfectly happy with it. I was providing what she wanted. I was providing a home. I was providing children. Uh, I was providing all the toys and a brand new car and a live-in maid. And, and she was happy with that. Then we came to America and the shit hit the fan. And all of a sudden, there's an affidavit in the family court. Steve was unfaithful to me in Thailand. <gasps> Big shock. Well, you know, she never said a word about it for the years it was going on in Thailand. Throughout the book, you mention an ex-girlfriend a lot. She comes up a yeah. lot. Yeah. And it seems to me, it's like, it's kind of like an obsession. Sure. It's like, yes. you, there was, I think there was one, one chapter where it was, it was kind of like a daydreaming chapter of what, what life could have yeah. been like. Yeah. And, you yeah. know, tell us about why, why was this person so special? I don't know. I, uh, I have OCD and I am obsessive compulsive about a lot of things. And yeah, I have not been able, I, I lived with that woman for five months and 10 days. Uh, and that was the best five months and 10 days of my life, bar none. I was happier in those months than I've ever been before or since. I don't know why her, she did not feel that way about me. She, she liked me, I think, but I was a meal ticket. She was very young. She had just started uh, in the bar business, tending bar. She was only tending bar at that point. And I convinced her to leave the bar and, and come live with me. And I would send her to school, bought her a motorcycle, paid for her school uniforms. She was finishing high school at, at night school. And we had, uh, yeah, my best five months and 10 days. Then the, Gulf, the first Gulf War happened. Uh, every hotel in Phuket closed its doors. I was teaching English in the hotels. That was my only, and writing for Phuket Magazine. The advertisers stopped paying Phuket Magazine. They stopped paying the writers. Uh, there was no more teaching on the island. I sold my motorcycle. We lived as long as we could off those profits. And then I put a ticket home on my uh, uh, credit card and I said, baby, I'll be back in six months. And I meant it, but when I got home, Turned out I had not ever paid my 1988 federal taxes before I moved to Thailand because I never thought I was coming back. So I said, you know, screw you, Uncle Sam. I'm not paying my taxes. I was working in the film industry on what's called a 1099, responsible for paying my own taxes. And I had not done so my last year in the business. So there was tax on $100,000 of income that they attached my wages as soon as I got back. And it took me a year to make the money to come back. And in that year, of course, she was an 18-year-old girl she met a 20-year-old Italian professional football player who was here. He hurt his knee in a match, and he came to Phuket to uh, uh, let his knee heal. 
He drove a chopper, he wore a black leather jacket in the tropics, don't ask me why, but she just fell head over heels for him the month before I came back. I had no idea until I got here and I, it was a kick in the nuts and she said, you know, no, we're not an item anymore. And I have never gotten over it. I mean, just literally. And yeah, and people, everybody, everybody watching this is gonna be saying, you know, dude, it's almost 30 years, get the fuck over it. Yeah, I've told, I've been in therapy, I've had therapists say, you know, this is really not healthy. And I go, yeah, fuck, I know. I know how unhealthy it is. But it's how I'm wired. And uh, I'm, I'm better about it, honest to God, I'm better about it now uh, than I was. She went on to marry a very wealthy guy. She lives in London in a house that was purchased for 2.5 million pounds. Uh, she did very well, not the Italian guy. He did what any 20 year old Italian would do to a Thai girl he met on Phuket on holiday. He said, you know, thank you and see ya. And he left and she never heard from him again. But she met this British guy in a snooker hall and uh, he fell in love with her and took her back and they have a beautiful family and uh, they travel all over the world. And she is a, a, a very well-moneyed British matron now. And uh, so it all turned out very well for her. And she'd be the first to say, Steve, this is creepy, you know, get over it. You know, I stopped thinking about you 30 years ago, but I'm not wired that way. I just, I hang on to shit, man. I hang on to shit. There's a question in here that, this one kind of, this, quest, this frustrated me reading this, right? Now, just let me, let me ask the question here. Sure, sure. A writer that you met in Phuket asked you to read their work. Mm -hmm. At this point, you were living back in Iowa and you said you were very unhappy with how your life was going. You wrote that you were jealous of this person's success and their life in Thailand. So you wrote them a 5,000 word critique that was dripping with poison. Those yeah. are your own words. You said that you knew this person, you now know this person's website address and you can contact them, but you, you wouldn't know what to say. What about now? If you saw this writer now, what would you say? Well, I have tried to contact him since writing that. First of all, and he, he did not respond. He's living in Cambodia at the moment. First of all, no. It, 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 it was a critical book review because his writing did not please me. Any writer or any reader has the right to comment honestly on anything he's read. I thought he was publishing really substandard writing. I said so because I was jealous. If I wasn't jealous of his life, I would have said, oh yeah, you know, yeah, it was nice. Yeah, I read it. Yeah, good for you. Uh, congratulations on being on publishing yourself. You know, I would have I would have been nice and, and polite and, and vague, but because at that point I was in the very nadir of my life. I, I was housebound for four years. I didn't leave the house for four years. I had severe social anxiety disorder. I went shopping at three in the morning because I couldn't stand the thought of meeting someone and having to make a conversation. So he caught me and he sent me his books in that period. And I, at first I didn't read them and he kept sending me emails and saying, what do you think? What do you think? What do you think? What do you think? So finally I read them and then I didn't comment. He kept saying, comment, what do you think? Comment. And one particular day I sat down at my keyboard and I said, you know, you shouldn't be writing. You shouldn't be publishing. You need to work harder at it. You're publishing everything you write and not all of it's great. And yeah, I didn't hear from him ever again. And I have reached out since then. I'm kind of in a period of my life right now. I'm trying to mend fences. because I've made a lot of enemies telling people what I think about their writing. And I reached out to him and, and he has not felt the need uh, to, to uh, write back. Right now you're on holidays. Yeah. You've been here for two weeks. Yeah. You fly back to America tomorrow. You don't tomorrow live morning. here full time. No. So what is the plan here? You're 64 years old. What is it? What, what, how, what's the next? chapter of your life going to be? Well, A, thank you for asking. I appreciate your interest. Uh, it's very flattering that you, you have any interest in my life at all. Uh, yeah, for 20 years, you know, in 1997, we took the kids home to Iowa, and I promised myself when we flew out that I would come back because I didn't want to leave. I, the most successful seven years of my life were here. Uh, the happiest, anyway, uh, were here. The only time in my life I ever drove a brand new car was on Phuket in the 90s. And I didn't want to leave, and I promised myself I'd come back. And then, you know, this shit hit the fan in America. My life went from bad to worse. And what kept me going for 20 years has been this dream, this promise, that when I turn 65, I can retire, I can draw my Social Security, and I will come back to Thailand, and I will make an effort 
to recapture some of that little bit of success or at least some of that little bit of contentment and happiness that I had here in the 90s. How realistic that dream is, I don't know, but I've never had a plan B. I've never been able to come up with anything else I wanted to do. And I have come back for two weeks each time, three times in the last 20 years. Each time I come back, I leave still wanting to come and live here. Not in Bangkok. I, I, I do not like Bangkok at all. Uh, but uh, an island somewhere with a beach. I like a beach. I'm not, I don't go in the water, but I like walking on the beach. I like uh, a quiet move on. I like a little house. I like a place I go for my rice and my, my glass noodle salad. I like, you know, another place I go for something else and another place I go to get my laundry done. And, and I like having a routine and I like rural Thailand with a beach. So, Ko Tao, Ko Samet, Ko Chang, Ko Samui, something, not Ko Samui, but something, you know, uh, with a beach, a little island with a beach. Uh, and that is the plan. A year from now, less than a year from now, I will retire and uh, draw my Social Security and I'll get on a plane at the El Paso Airport, airport God willing, and I will come back to uh, my beloved Thailand and, and, and give it a shot. Is it possible that you're searching for something that existed mm -hmm. in the 90s, prime your life, yeah. that doesn't exist anymore? Well, I think the word possible, is it possible, that's being generous. I, it does not exist. Phuket in 1988 does not exist. I mean, I went back to Phuket last week and there's nothing there except my, my dear old friends. There's nothing there that reminds me of the place I came to in 1988. Uh, all of the Sabai Sabai, all of the Jai Yen Yen is gone. The, the whole vibe, the whole feeling of the place, it's crowded, it's filthy, oh my God. Even now, after two years of no tourists, there's trash everywhere. Uh, there's stray dogs everywhere. There's ugly, ugly Falang who don't know how to behave everywhere. And uh, yeah, it, 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 it's not there. And it's probably not on Koh Chang, it's not on Koh Samet or, 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 or Koh Tao. But like I said, I don't have a plan B. I gotta look for it. Maybe it's in Cambodia. You know, Cambodia's got beaches. I have friends in Cambodia. I have friends who've bailed out of here and gone to Cambodia. Maybe it's in Cambodia. And here's that, that sun, which is nobody's friend in, in Thailand. Uh, <laughs> but I like to think it, it flatters me. Uh, yeah, so, so I think, yeah, you ask, is it possible that it doesn't exist? Yeah, I'm certain it doesn't exist, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna try, dude. I, I don't have any other plan. Okay, so Steve, there was a very interesting part of the book that involved the crown prince of Denmark and that incident with that crown prince led to a whole chain of events that mm. ultimately changed your life. Can you tell us what happened there? Well, uh, the last four years I was on Phuket, I was supplementing my writing income because I had children and a very expensive high society wife. So I got a legit job that came with a work permit at a place called the Boathouse on Kata Beach on Phuket. I was the public relations manager there. Sweet, sweet job. Basically, I was a dancing monkey. I would sit with people and, and talk with people in the dining room and invite journalists and things down and do PR and, and get the, the word out about this hotel. It was a sweet, sweet job. And part of that was whenever we had a VIP guest, I would get a picture of them in the dining room as soon as the food was served, when it was all still pretty on the table, and that picture I would send out to the usual media outlets, which in those days were primarily print outlets. There wasn't much of an internet. We're talking uh, 1997. There, there wasn't, at least on Phuket, much of an internet presence, and what there was was spotty. And uh, we had a little local TV station, but for the most part, it was all magazines and newspapers. So it was about still photos of VIPs in your dining room. So the Crown Prince of Denmark, Hendrik, I think his name is, uh, and by now, who knows, he may be the king. Uh, he was staying up in the Laguna complex and uh, got tired of Thai food, wanted to eat French food. And the Boathouse Kitchen at that time did the best French food on Phuket, bar none. So he called down, he had his secretary call down and say, we want room for six uh, for a meal at lunchtime. And so, you know, the whole, the whole place goes into hyperactivity. The sommelier spends two hours in the cellar picking the wines. You've got, uh, I think, 13 pieces of cutlery at each place settings. You've got six glasses at each place. I mean, a full-on royal treatment in a private dining room. And the general manager there at that time was a, uh, a kind of flouncy French guy. 
And uh, w when the prince showed up, typically I would meet the VIP guest in the lobby, make a few jokes, shake a few hands, lead them to the dining room, and do my dancing monkey. Keep them entertained, say outrageous American shit, which for some reason Americans are allowed to get away with. Uh, certainly Australians are not. But we're allowed to say all kinds of outrageous shit among European royalty, and they, they laugh at it. They like it. It's irreverent and fun. So that would be my shtick. Well, on this occasion, because the crown prince was a very attractive young man, our general manager decided that he would take him to the dining room and he would sit at what was supposed to be my spot and entertain the prince. So he comes swishing up and he grabs the prince and he says to me, you wait at the bar, I'll call you when the food arrives, you come take your picture. So I sat at the bar with my camera and a coffee and a cigarette and another cigarette and another cigarette and another cigarette and after an hour, uh, the drivers start coming down and bringing the cars up and the meal's over and nobody's ever, we don't have a picture. Well, we're giving away the food. It's probably, you know, more than a thousand dollars worth of food. We're giving it away to get that photograph. That's the whole, that's PR, that's marketing, that's what you're doing. So I go upstairs and everybody's getting up from a table that's just, you know, after a big meal. It's covered with dirty plates and dirty cutlery and empty glasses, but I got to get a picture. So I asked the GM and the prince to stand together behind the table. I take a picture. The next day, I send this picture out to the usual, you know, make a bunch of copies. In those days, everything was on a copy. You didn't have a digital file. And I sent it out to all the usual suspects. And I put one picture on our bulletin board in our lobby. Every, anytime you have a VIP guest in a hotel, you want your current guests to know that you're hosting royalty. Even just nobility, even if it's just a rock star, you, you put that picture up. So I come in the office the next morning and that picture's torn up in my mailbox. So I go to the GM, I say, who's, who's torn up this picture? And he says, look, there's a package of Marlboro cigarettes on the table in front of the prince. You cannot imply that the prince, the crown prince, uses any particular product. I said, Louis, those are your damn cigarettes. The, crown, the prince doesn't smoke. Those are your cigarettes on the table. Why didn't you pick them up? I mean, the table was all cluttered and dirty. I didn't notice them. I was focused on the two human beings in my, my photo. So we had an argument about that, uh, which turned into shouting in two languages. I knocked over a potted palm and I stormed out. Either I quit or I was fired. The jury is still out on which, what actually happened. But it was that event. I borrowed a pickup truck. I cleaned up my office and I left the best job I'd ever had including my job in the film industry, uh, the job I loved the most, I left it in the space of half an hour after three and a half years of enjoying every single day in that job and uh, went home and told my wife that I no longer worked at the boathouse and I was going to have to truck some resumes around to other hotels. And she said, well, we own a house in Iowa. The kids are, were thinking about schools and I didn't want to, I had told her I didn't want the kids to go to school in, in Thailand. She said, maybe this is a good time to go back to Iowa. And she had never expressed any interest in visiting America. And before she could change her mind, I had the four of us on a plane. I left Phuket within six days of the incident with the Crown Prince. And everything that has happened since, everything that's in the book Leaving Thailand, this interview, this trip to Thailand, it's all a result of the Crown Prince of Denmark deciding he was tired of Thai food. He wanted to eat French for lunch that day. And then the dominoes just went click, 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 click. Steve, I think we'll leave it there. All right, it's, thank you. Uh, it's a fantastic book. Very thank you. entertaining. Thank you. Sad, funny, it's got it all. And what I'm going to do is there's a link leaving Thailand. I'm going to leave a link in the description. It's on Amazon, right? You can buy it on Amazon. It's on Amazon with four other of my books if, uh, if people decide they like Steve's writing. Yeah. There you go. Steve, it's a pleasure. Thank you, Pete. Um, it's interesting to meet you, and um, you I wish you, you the best in your future. I know it's going to be interesting. I'm, I have a feeling I might see you on YouTube in the future. You never know. From your lips to God's ears, I hope so. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, folks. If you enjoyed this interview, hit the like button. And if you're not already subscribed, hit the subscription button. We're trying to get to 5K as fast as possible. I hope we can do it. We will do it. We will do it. And I'll see you on the next one. Take care of yourself.